Earth, everybody. And thank y'all again so much for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And as always, sitting beside me, Santa's right-hand man, Kyle Phils. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in a wintry skeleton studios woo, getting woo, woo. ready for the Christmas holidays. Hey, yes, Christmas is here, man. I'm decorating this whole studio next year. Are you? What are you going to yeah. be putting in here? I don't know. We're going to decorate. Yeah, we're going to have tinsel? tinsel and festoon lighting. Those... Remember the lights that look, do they still make them look like uh, icicles? Like uh, the long yeah. plastic ones that look like they would, you know, like they were moving or dripping. The, lights, those the lights they do, but do you remember the old tinsel where it would just like yeah. get, I don't think they make that anymore. It ruined too many vacuum cleaners. It ruined the world. They don't need to make tinsel. It tinsel gets, and glitter. All glitter is, is chopped up tinsel. I remember pretending like I was a wizard. I would scoop my feet in the carpet <laughs> to build up like a electronic uh, yeah, static yeah. electricity. And then I could get like this by the tinsel and it would come up to me. Like, I'd be like uh, Use I was, the force? I was pretending I was using the force. Heck, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. You know, when you're a kid, that's, that's what you do. Well, that's what we got to do as adults. We now have to find ways to make it fun because it's otherwise just overwhelming trying to keep up with everything. It has been madness for me bringing this daughter of mine back. Yeah, she's graduated from college. Oh, she graduated. She's back. She got a job. She's starting her job uh, at the school right after the first year. It's just been haywire and hectic, but it's fun. Yeah, well, she's not right. the only one leaving Texas A&M. I think there's a mass exodus over there. It looks like most of their football team left. Oh, yep, that happens. Yeah, it they, happens. They got rid of their coach. It's It's been, it's man, it, it has been a, hey, one heck of a month for me. Only way to go is up from the A&M football program, I'm just saying. <laughs> only way to go is up. <clears throat> it's been a crazy month it's for been me, too. one week since you looked. All right, sorry. Yeah, it, it's uh, I've just had a never-ending problem with vehicles this last month. I, didn't, I just don't understand. You have been... Struggling like you've been touched with evil when it comes. To yeah, must did you sage the vehicle? Uh, I did because not. it seems like it's acting like you did. <laughs> I think I did something in a former life. I'm being <laughs> punished now. Uh, but yeah, lo, Luke is ready. The big boys they're ready for Christmas. Everybody's ready for Christmas. It's uh, it's been a quite enjoyable time as far as all that goes. I, Christmas shopping. I luckily got all that done early this oh, yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to go pick up a few things yesterday with my wife, and we went to Super Target. Sorry, uh, and man. It was madness. The amount of people is crazy. I don't understand why when it comes to this time of year, right? It should be no surprise. You, you know there's going to be a lot of shoppers. Why Old do they man have, rant coming. Why Old do they man have rant. three of 47 registers open? You must have like, gone to, I know where you went. I know. I was at Target. Target. <laughs> I said Target. I was at Target. But it's like that every time I go. Uh, a week ago, I went to a local sporting goods store right here to pick up some ammunition. Because mm-hmm. I got my toy from the ATF. And when I was in there, same thing. Two registers open. Each one, each line had a line of no exaggeration, thirty-seven people in it. You're Ugh. like, and then there's other employees, like kind of standing around, pretending to be busy. That's me. I'm that kind of employee. Yeah, I believe that. Just like <laughs> get over there, unlock your register. Let's go. Let's move it, people. I'm busy now. Quit looking over here my way. This is a business, right? You can get people in and out quicker. You're going to make more money. Yeah, such an old man. I am an old Anything man. crazy or weird happened Let while you've been see. out and about? You heard any crazy stories, any family sharing of anything, strange sightings? I haven't heard any crazy stories from family, but I'm sure I'm going to get an ear beating coming up because we have Christmas Eve at my mother's, yeah. Christmas Day at my house, and then I have another Christmas with my wife's family. And every time I get over there, this is the thing. Everybody knows what we do, and so they want to pick my brain about cryptids and UFOs and things. And it's like every time we get together, it's like the same thing. I'm like, okay, can we talk about something different? No. They don't want to talk to me about anything else. Because you're not cool about anything else. I'm not cool about anything. That's right. If they don't have that to talk with you, they don't want to speak with you, man. You just have to take what you get. So I know (laughs) of two family members for sure, I'm sure, will inform me of some wild stories and I'll have to report back. That'll be awesome. Remember me. What What do you got? You got big plans for Christmas? No, no. Are you kidding? The kids come by. I get to hang out with the granddaughter, all that. We do it on Christmas Eve. And then Christmas Day is a free for all for us. Most of the time we go to the movies. Does your granddaughter ever take any pictures with Santa? Uh, yeah. She calls him old guy. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's fitting. She was like, yeah, there's old guy. And she just always points at Santa. There's old guy. Look, Does she think old guy brings her gifts? I think she digs it like old guy drops stuff off. I don't, I don't know. It's just funny because they try to get her to say Santa and she's like, it's old guy. Yeah. Hey, whatever. Yeah, can't argue with her. Yeah. So, and then we get to party with her on New Year's Eve. She's going to come stay with with Grump. So we're going to have a good time. Oh, that's good. I have absolutely no plans for New Year's Eve. Oh, I'll be in bed by 10. Yeah, I probably will be, too, because the next day there's going to be some really good football games. Oh, and then there's also uh, the the hockey outside. The Winter Classic. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, I don't even know. I enjoy it. They're doing that in Seattle, I think, this year. It is. I think it's the Kraken. It's the Kraken versus the 
Golden Knights. Look at ooh. I think I won't. Be I despise that. the Golden Knights. I was like, I won't be watching that. Hey, look, I got to share something with all of y'all. But enough with the Christmas talk. I want to creep you out. And like everyone listening knows, I always like to hook Kyle with headlines. Mm -hmm. He, it's like I'm fishing, right? I just put a headline on the hook, toss it out there. I catch a Kyle every time. Kyle, Central Texas witness watches a massive feral hog shape shift into a Bigfoot like biped. Now you had why'd you have to tell gotcha. me that? Gotcha. Because every gotcha. time I'm out there in the in in the stand and I see these pigs, which That's I do almost like. every time, I'm gonna be looking for them to shape shift into something. When I hear them start squealing, I'm gonna start texting you and be like, "Oh, he's changing." I like them when they shape shift into <laughs> bacon. I like them when they shape shift from standing to lying down with a hole in them. That's how I like them to shift. Okay, Salon so fired this off. Look, you're gonna dig this. It says I'm an avid outdoorsman and know most of the wildlife Texas has to offer. Now, I live in central Texas, about 10 miles outside of Austin, near the town of Manor. Now, I live in a fairly large apartment complex, and outside of my back porch is a highline easement about 40 yards out, and running through it, there are always wild turkey, deer, rabbits, skunks, possums, and other animals, as well as a substantial-sized family of wild hogs. Well, one evening at early dusk and still plenty of light left, I was grilling some burgers and staring out at the other side of the high lines at that tree line. There's a row of sugar cane along the outer edge of these trees that I have ranged at 106 yards. I jokingly said aloud, Come on, Sasquatch. I know you're out there. Just show yourself. I like this. So at that exact moment, a huge object walked out from behind the cane into the open. It was about four foot high, seven to eight feet long, and it walked out about 10 yards and stopped. That surprised me so much that I said loudly, Oh, wow! That's when it turned around and walked back towards the cane. I got a good look at it. It looked like a huge boar hog. I guess around maybe four to five hundred pounds. I'm going to stop right there. That's massive. Yeah. The odds of... Look, they look way bigger than they are. We've said that before. 100%. But still, that's a big animal. Instantly, and it says it was massive compared to the hogs that I had seen out there before. So that's your first telltale sign. That doesn't fit in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right? Like, wait a minute. Is it a slow elk? Those are cattle, okay? It's an Angus out right? there. As it walked behind the edge of the cane line, I swear it stood up on its hind legs and walked behind the cane completely out of sight. It looked exactly like a Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever they're called. It was just like all the photos and drawings we see. As it disappeared into the woods, I was dumbfounded, to say the least, and I still questioned my sanity about what I saw. But what I understand after thinking about this, maybe it was some sort of shape shifting or something. I don't know, but I do know I saw what looked like a huge wild hog stand up and walk off on its hind legs. I've never seen or heard of this happening before. I've seen hogs stand up on their hind legs momentarily, but never walk as this thing did. And yet it was only like four foot tall. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. Very. So, so what, the, what I've learned is people, every time you see wild animals, just start calling it out, right? Hey, Sasquatch. Yeah. Show yourself. Isn't that what he said? What did he say exactly? Yeah. Oh, he goes, come on, Sasquatch, I know you're out there, so just show yourself. Yeah, say that, and you might get a, a cool response. The idea, look we've, look, we've seen pigs get up on the side of things, watch them scratch, watch them stand up on stumps, you know, just put their front legs up on it. But I don't even know, like, you know, you've seen dogs walk on their hind legs. Yeah. Right? yeah. I, I don't think that you could even train a pig. It's not built for that, right? It's built like a barrel. So it's not really made to walk like that. So if you see what looks or appears to be a hog stand up on its hind legs and start walking, start taking notice because you got something crazy going on. Could it have been a black bear? You know what? I guess it could have. I mean, it's, I know they're not native to 10 miles outside of Austin, yeah. but there are black bear in East Texas and they don't know they're not in East Texas. I mean, but here's the weird possible? thing. Seven to eight feet long, four foot tall. That is a long thing. That's what he described it as. It's seven to eight foot. Yeah. Four foot tall at the shoulder. I don't yeah, know. Bear that's... don't look that long unless they're polar bear. I wonder if, could it be an escaped, like, gorilla? Or it could just be a Sasquatch. Or it could be just a Sasquatch. Four. You know what? I'm more likely to believe it's a Sasquatch than an escaped gorilla. 
Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like really and truly, like even knowing what we know about all the people down here that have all these crazy pets, I think it's less likely because here's my thing. How far, let's just hypothetically speak, let's say a gorilla escaped. How far do you think an escaped gorilla would travel in the in the forests of Texas? I have no idea. That's a good question. Right? Like, I don't think they would go far. I can't see them being just putting in 100 miles running away from whatever they were running from. I see them getting out and being, like most primates, extremely curious. Yeah, I'm going to go back to my 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 standard re- response is it's a narco dealer's pet that That's got it. loose, I'm right? I'm with you on that. Because they always seem to want to possess exotic animals. Yeah, yeah. Pablo and his hippos. What and- they didn't show is that that gorilla rode a hippo mm-hmm. up there, got off, went out and checked it in the field, and walked back and got on his hippo and rode off. Maybe all Sasquatch can shape shift, and that's why they're in they're, the pigs? they're around or whatever. I'm Maybe they down. can choose. And they're around us more than you think. It would make sense. And if you yell out, hey, Sasquatch, reveal yourself, then they'll, then they'll, they'll show yourself. <laughs> reveal yourself, <laughs> then, they'll, then they'll show up. That's as, right. And they go back to their true form. I mean, as long as we're going to just speculate, I'm not just like really it. ramp up the story. I like it. I like it better. It's a that cool part. story. Speaking yeah. of cool stories, I love a good Glimmer Man story. Yes. Check this one out. It says in early March of 2020, I was sitting upright in my upstairs master bedroom feeding my three-month-old daughter a bottle. The TV was off, and it was dark outside, and approximately about 6.30 p.m. For purposes of the story, the layout of the room is very important. From my seated position to my immediate right was my bathroom. Then a little up from the bathroom was a dresser with a mirror on it, and then up from that was an open door to the hallway. The bathroom light was on, My bedside table light was on, and I could see a little bit into the hallway. Anyway, I'm feeding my daughter and quietly enjoying a moment to myself while my wife and three-year-old were downstairs watching TV. As I'm feeding her, I catch movement in the hallway, outside of the bedroom. I saw it out of the corner of my eye, and then pivoted my face to look at the movement. What I saw... Well, I can't really explain, but the feeling in my chest was an immediate rush of anxiety. I saw a darkened but transparent torso shape with no legs and no head, and it was moving toward or into the bedroom. It looked like a shadow through a screen door. It didn't float, but shuffled as if walking, and the torso would have been about my height. I'm around 5'10". The shadow or glimmer crossed into the bedroom and then in front of the mirror, but it cast no shadow and did not reflect in the mirror in any way. I watched it as it crossed into the light of the bathroom and then disappeared. My daughter's eyes flashed open, which was strange because she was sleep-eating, and I noped the hell right out of the room as fast as I could. If I hadn't been holding her, I would have left her on the bed. The being was not a shadow. I repeat not a shadow. No cars passed in front of the house, and my other child and wife were below me in the TV room. It could not have been something moving in front of the house because the shape or shadow would have changed as it crossed the dividing wall between the hallway and the bedroom. I grabbed my baseball bat and went back through every room in the house, but I found nothing. Like my Louisville slugger would have been able to do anything about it anyways, but I had to try. I'm not a believer but I'm not against the idea of other things beyond my scope of understanding being out there in the world. What the heck did I see, C.A.? So, this is a common question when it comes to the Glimmer Man, especially when it's indoors. Now, I don't know why it is this way, but when you see it inside of a house, it always makes me think, well, there's a very fine line between a Glimmer Man and a ghost. That's true. Where if it's outdoors, I just don't, I don't know why. When it's outdoors, it seems like, oh, that seems like a natural setting for a a cloaked predator like being, but indoors, I always want to go to. I gravitate towards a ghost, but a I don't spirit know. Spirit or specter? Yeah, maybe that's one and the same. Maybe it is. Maybe every Glimmer Man sighting that's ever happened was nothing more than a ghost or a spirit, or they're two separate things. I don't know. It's so the idea of Glimmer Man being in the home is so interesting. It's very interesting to me. Uh, I mean, we've been exploring it. We've been collecting stories for quite a while. Uh, we got some plans on doing some neat things in the future 
with our Glimmer Man sightings. But uh, before we get into all that, Ooh. let's take a break. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about some mysterious missing uh, European gold from World War II. Ooh. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Deep in the Austrian Alps, early one morning in 1945, Ida Weisenbacher answered a knock at her door. The 21-year-old Austrian farm girl found herself confronted with a Nazi officer. Get up, immediately, he told her. Sofort aufstehen! Hitch up the horse and wagon. We need you. Anspannen den Wagenwagen! Wird brachen dick! Weisenbacher did as she was told and pulled the family wagon up next to the military vehicle. Soldiers then loaded heavy boxes onto the wagon. Each was marked with a series of letters and numbers that gave no hint as to the contents. When the wagon was loaded, the officer told the girl to drive it to nearby Lake Toplitz. Once she was given the destination the need for the wagon became obvious. The road did not go all the way to the lake. Only the horse-drawn wagon could take the cargo over the final distance. It took three trips to transport the whole load to the lake. On the final run, Weisenbacher saw that the soldiers were out on the lake and that the boxes were slowly being dropped into the water. They quickly sunk out of sight. Weisenbacher wondered what the boxes contained, that they had to be sunk to the bottom of that deep, dark, cold place. What secrets did they possess? Let's start at the beginning. In 1933, until the end of World War II, the Nazis began organized looting of European countries during the time of the Third Reich. Most of it was done by a special military unit known as the Kunstschlutz. Now they took everything from everybody. They took gold. They took silver. They took all types of currency. They took jewels, paintings, ceramics, books, sculptures, religious treasures, and more. You name it, Cam, they took it. They were just going around the countryside, stealing everything that they could. And they took all this and they shipped it all back to Berlin, where it was to be systematically cataloged and eventually sold for profit 
or also some of it was stored for later use. It's estimated that the Nazis seized, now get this, as many as 16,000 works of art. Wow. Right? So basically imagine like a plague moving across this country land of, of Eastern Europe and all of Europe, you know, slowly from Germany on outward. And as they're going, they're robbing every bank they come across. They're robbing every museum they come across. The people that they're, you know, capturing and, and moving and some of them to concentration camps, they're taking all the private art collections oh, yeah. that those people have. They would literally go into your house. They'd take all your silverware. They'd take all your paintings. They'd take all your family jewels. Anything of value, basic. So they were just like raping and pillaging the land as they spread. And there's nothing you could do about it at no. that time. There's nothing. What are catch, you going to do? They're just going to kill you. Catch a bullet? Yeah. I mean, they just were, you name it, they were taking it. All types of stuff. Like we were talking about gold, silver, you know, jewels and everything. And uh, especially artwork. And they say that that's the main thing is, you know, gold and stuff can be replaced. But some of these precise, some of these beautiful works of art. They'll never be replaced. Yeah. You can't recreate that. It's only a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Mm-hmm. Adolf Hitler himself, he was somewhat of an unsuccessful artist who was actually denied admission to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. Anyways, he always considered himself to be a connoisseur of the arts, and he especially liked classical portraits or landscapes by old masters, particularly those of Germanic origin. And did you know, Cam, that he despised modern art, especially like cubism and futurism, and dataism, he hated modern art. Really? Yeah, he despised it. And he had all of them sold that they confiscated, of course. All the ones that had modern art in it, he had them sold. And the ones he couldn't sell, he had them burned and destroyed. Wow. So it'd be like you. Like, you just, just despised the culture club. Any culture club CD or record or tape you come across, I don't, you, you just would burn it. I'm just saying. Okay. Oh, you don't? I thought you did. I thought you no. despised it. No. Who is it that you despise? Kyle Filson. No, I'm talking. No, I despise that man. Yeah, your music is terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I, I don't know. If there's any. I despise sharks. <laughs> That's what I despise. I can't imagine doing that though. Like that, because you hate. Okay, it's one thing to be, just like you said, just running over the land, taking whatever you want. But the fact that you hate something so much that you wipe it off the planet, you, he just destroyed artwork that, like you said, it can never be replaced. It's gone. Yeah, I mean, they may have been the amazing works of art in some people's eyes. Nah, we're just gonna burn it. We're done with it. Yeah, he didn't want. It. He didn't even want it around. He didn't want it to exist unless he could profit from it. Golly! Now, now when they confiscated all these things, they uh, especially the artwork we're talking about right now, they they tried to sell them. Like I said, the ones they didn't that didn't sell, they would get rid of. But the sales that they tried to do, they didn't go that well. And so on March twentieth, nineteen thirty nine, they set a huge fire. And they said in this fire, which they burned right there in the courtyard of the Berlin Fire Department, they said, get this, that they set a fire, 1,004 rare and priceless works of art. And they said that they burned another 3,825 art, uh, watercolors, drawings, and prints that they didn't care for. So they just destroyed all this. Mm. Now, all of this looting... Of course, amassed hundreds of thousands of valuable objects from the occupied nations. They stored most of them, get this, in salt mines and caves. Well, I knew about stuff being stored in salt mines because of the lack of humidity they and said, moisture. That's exactly right. They said that the caves offer an appropriate humidity and temperature condition that is really good for artwork. And also, by putting them in the caves, it kind of protected them from the Allied bombing raids. So that's what they were storing these things. Makes sense. Now, all of this artwork, as well as the gold and the silver and the currency and other precious items, this was considered the largest robbery in history. You know, like I was talking about, they robbed every bank they came across. You know, and you have to remember, when it comes to banks and stuff, this is long before the digital age. You know, modern banks don't actually hold that much cash on hand, but back then, they did. A lot of the banks then still had gold bars in all their vaults. They had a lot of paper money, different currency, so you could imagine... If you were to come and capture that, there's a lot to be taken. You know, you always hear these jokes and stories of these guys that rob a bank here now, a modern bank, and what do they walk out with, like, $1,500? dollars mm-hmm. Because there's just, they don't have time to access the vaults, and so they just clear out, like, the tellers mm-hmm. tell, and there's not much in there. But back then, it was different. Now, here's another thing you may not know, that even the victims of the Holocaust, 
uh, they of course had all of their valuables stripped. They had all their all their gold jewelry, a lot of family heirlooms, like people would have like you know earrings from your mother, something like that. That was all taken. Mm-hmm. They even took gold teeth at a dead people's mouths. Mm. So when they would like say you would shoot a bunch of guys at a concentration camp or working, they would have for every reason shoot them in the back of the head. They'd make sure that you took the gold teeth out. <laughs> the gold from these sources was then melted down and cast into bars with the mark of the German Central Bank, the Reichsbank, and printed on them. Now, much of this loot was, of course, used to pay for the war effort. But what a lot of people don't know is that a large portion was still intact and in Nazi hands at the end of the war. And in February 1945, the president of the Reichsbank ordered that the majority of the gold reserves be sent to the village of Merkers, some 200 miles south of of Berlin. There it was concealed in deep underground bases in a potassium mine. The mine was also used to store many art treasures, some belonging to German museums, others looted from conquered nations. In April, Merkers was captured by the U.S. Third Army Command, and it was commanded by Lieutenant General George Patton. You're aware of that. Mm -hmm. And French civilians who had worked at the mine told the American military what was hidden there. And the hoard was soon in American hands. Now, the tally of the treasure showed that there were 8,198 bars of gold bullion in the mine, along with gold coins, silver bars, and paper money. The total value in 1945 dollars was estimated to be over $520 million. Now, this got me wondering. How much would that be in today's dollars, right? Mm-hmm. So I went to a website, and I found... a. Uh, a website called dollartimes.com. And on there, they have an inflation calculator. Pretty cool. All you have to do is put the year in and what year it is now and perhaps the an older year, you know, if, depending on what time period you're trying to look up. And it will spit out the amount. Now, you can try it at home if you like. It's called dollartimes.com. Of course, I'll put it in the show notes. Anyways, $500 million in 1945. Do you have any idea what that's worth today? Not a clue. Right. Check this out. It's worth six billion eight hundred and fifty nine million six hundred and seventy six thousand four hundred and four dollars and forty nine cents. So that's what it would be like stealing today. That's right. If that, that same amount of money, that's what it would be worth today. Yep. Wow. And that's in just one of these mines. Six billion in gold. In one mine. In one mine. Shh. Now now this one mine, of course, was one of the largest ever found, and it did constitute the bulk of the Nazi loot, but it did not contain all of it some of the gold and other valuables had been left in the town of berlin and by april 1945 the allies were closing in on the german capital and nazi officials decided to move the remaining contents of the reichsbank to Oberbayern in southern bavaria there in the mountains the nazis hoped to hold out and try to regroup so the Americans had already captured this large cachet they mm-hmm. had of gold and stuff. And so they knew, look, they don't have all of our money, but they got a large portion of it. We better start making, we got to figure out, we got to start stashing it. You know, it's like we were talking about off air. You were talking about uh, Narcos, the show on Netflix mm-hmm. about Pablo Escobar, how he just started stashing money everywhere because he didn't want to get caught at one single spot or the DEA or whoever was raiding would ha- or, you know, even a rival was to bust him or you kill all him, that cash. they would all be around. there. You know, yeah. So you don't just leave your all your money in your wallet. You only put a portion of your wallet. The rest mm-hmm. you put in different banks. So that's what they were doing. They said at least nine tons of gold. Nine tons of gold. You know how much gold is a pound, right? <laughs> nine tons of at gold. Least, at least all right. nine tons of gold were sent to Oberbayern, along with bags of foreign currency and coins. Now, this treasure, including 730 gold bars, was thought to be hidden around, now I'm going to butcher this name, Lake Valkensee. After the end of the war, U.S. soldiers were able to find an account for 11 million of that final hoard. So again, I'm going to go back to our trusty dollartimes.com calculator. And in today's dollar amount, $11 million is $145,108,539. $145,108,539.33. They should have. Like, right? I mean, you should have never found this website. <laughs> again, a huge amount. 
So at the end of the war, they were only able to account for 11 million of the final horde. So there's a lot out there. That means at that time there was over 3 million that's never been found, even to this day. And of course, you know, again, I'm going to round off this time. That's almost $40 million today of unaccounted for treasure that's still out there. Let's get to looking. Right? Of course, a small portion of it might have been smuggled out of the country by escaping Nazi officials. Mm-hmm. Of course. But what happened to the rest of the gold? You know, we've talked with Gerard Williams and and things like that. We know that uh, Hitler and Eva Braun and, you know, Martin Bormann were all supposedly transported by a submarine, a U-boat, and lived out the rest of their days in Argentina. Could they have filtered out some of that money uh, to Argentina? It's possible, right? Yeah. But there's also stories of it being in the ground. Now, this missing treasure, it's, of course, unarguably one of the largest missing treasures in the whole world. And you've watched these shows where people are looking for sunken treasure, but there's nothing this large that's never been discovered. And like I was talking about in the story that I read at the beginning about Lake Toplitz, well, Lake Toplitz happens to be one of the spots that people today think that there's still Nazi treasure in that lake. In the, like, tossed off in the water. Uh Uh-huh. Lake Toplitz is one mile long, and it lies between steep limestone cliffs in the Salzkammergut region of Austria. It is a beautiful but remote place. The water is over 300 feet deep, and it's oxygenless. Now, without oxygen, nothing can live in the lake except some specialized bacteria and one species of worm. With its dark, deep recesses and isolated location, the lake seems like the perfect place for someone to hide something. Were the boxes seen by Ida Weisenbacher that I talked about in the beginning story, filled with some of the missing gold? Is that what she saw? She never claimed she knew it was in the boxes, just that she was loaded her wagon up, made three trips. Remember the Nazi Mm -hmm. official came to her door and she saw the German soldiers throwing it in the lake. Could that be actual boxes of gold? You know, a lot of people in the area think it might be. In 1959, the German magazine Stern actually sent divers to the lake to investigate. And what they found was not gold, but they found crates of counterfeit British pounds and some secret documents and a printing press. Cam, have you ever heard of Operation Bernhard? Uh, no. No? You're not familiar with Operation Bernhard? No. I don't... No, I don't think so. I'm sitting here trying to think about... Because there's, there's so many that we've... Right. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and say no. Okay. Well, let me explain it to you. It was learned... That what they had found, these divers, was the remnants of a secret German project called Bernhard. Now, the idea for the operation had come from Adolf Hitler himself. What they would do is they would take skilled printers, and they were recruited from concentration camps, and they were given the best printing and graphic equipment available. Their assignment was to counterfeit enemy currency, and it would be used to pay for the war effort, and at the same time, weaken the enemy's economies. So they thought that they could counterfeit the enemy's money and then put that into the... Flood it. Flood the market with this stuff, and it would actually weaken everybody else's dollar. That's pretty ingenious back in the day, right? I mean, that is pretty ingenious. I would never have thought of that. Now, it's estimated that... Because you're not a piece of shit. That's why you don't think of things like that. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Well, let me rephrase that. You're not as big a piece of shit as some of those guys were. (laughs) That's why you don't think of that. (laughs) Right? Now, they estimate that the equivalent of $4.5 billion was forged in Operation Bernhard. Now, most of the false money were British pounds. The operation was so successful that at the end of the war, the Bank of England recalled and redesigned all of its currency. The American dollar was also a target, but the war ended before any significant amount of U.S. money was able to be made. I got you. So when Operation Bernhard was moved out of Berlin, the SS apparently chose to hide the evidence at the bottom of Lake Toplitz. So the question remains, was there anything else hidden there, or was it just this counterfeit money uh, scheme that they had been working out? Now, in 1963, a German sport diver was hired to find out. Unfortunately, he died in the attempt, and the Austrian government responded by making it illegal to dive in the lake for the purpose of hunting treasure. 
But secretly, the Austrians, the Austrian government, started a search of their own. Now, this secret operation located 18 crates of counterfeit money on the bottom, along with printing plates needed to make the foraging, forgeries. Rockets, they also found projectiles, they found mines, and they, find, they found other experimental weapons, and these were all salvaged from the bottom of the lake. Now, apparently, during the war, Toplitz, that's Lake Toplitz, had been used to test torpedoes and even a missile that could be launched by submarine from underwater. Because there was nothing living in this lake, it mm-hmm. made a perfect testing ground oh, for them to test stuff. So once again, you, you got these crazy, I'm always picturing these crazy Nazi scientists always testing stuff. I always think of, I don't know why, a guy in like a lab coat, and they always just seem smarter just because they're speaking German. You know, It's not <laughs> yeah. real, but it's like, oh, this is a missile. Okay, this guy's a rocket engineer. You're like, okay, hey, my name's Bob. I'm from you know Santa Fe, New Mexico. Then you got, this guy is a missile, a rocket engineer. This is, you know... I don't even know a name. Maximilian <laughs> Wehrmacht. And he's like, yes, I am. You know, you're like, this guy obviously knows about rockets. <laughs> exactly. Right? But why why is it, that? Why does it seem that way? Well, it's the same thing as like you're talking about is like I'm picturing all like you're talking about this, all this testing and stuff that goes on there. Is it like, I, I don't know, the very first uh, 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 Captain America. I picture all the crazy, like all the gadgets and stuff that they had, uh-huh. you know, or the same as like Iron Sky. You know what movie I'm talking about? Iron yeah, Sky. yeah, yeah. All of it's, why do I think that they just have the coolest stuff? They just always seem to. I don't know why it's in my head like that. Well, it's because their uniforms, their military uniforms, the Nazis I'm talking about, was designed by Hugo Boss. I mean, he's he's known for fashion. It's true. They do look sharp. I have to admit, their uniforms do look sharp. Yeah, they right? do. Anyways, by 1983... It was thought that the lake, Lake Toplitz, was completely cleaned of all Nazi material. But in that same year, a biologist by the name Professor Hans Frick started diving in Toplitz and found even more items. Now, Frick hadn't initially been interested in treasure at all, but had obtained a special permission from the Austrian government to dive in the lake to research what kind of life might survive in its oxygenless depths. He discovered several types of bacteria and a worm that managed to live under the harsh conditions. But while he was looking for those animals, he found more counterfeit British pounds, along with additional military hardware. His discoveries sparked more speculation that the lake still hid gold bullion. If it did, though, Frick never came across it. Now, the most complete examination of the lake came in 2000, when an American television network, CBS, along with the World Jewish Congress, sponsored an exploration of Toplitz by a company called Oceaneering Technologies. Now, Oceaneering Technologies went over the bottom of the entire lake, inch by inch, using a remote-controlled submarine named Phantom. They found the floor of the lake covered with trees that had fallen off the surrounding mountains. In some places, the wood was stacked as deep as 60 feet, This made using the submarine very difficult. It had a long tether on it, which connected it to the crew on the surface, and it was always in danger of being tangled in some of the dead branches or some of the roots of these fallen trees. When the robot submarine found what looked like the remains of a crate, Oceaneering sent down a manned submarine that, of course, found more forged British banknotes. Now, it would seem that all this searching you know, the reputation, of course, of Lake Toplitz as a location for a lost treasure should all be over with by now because they searched every inch and they didn't find anything but more British forgeries. But this isn't the case. Some people, to, even to this day, continue to believe that the lakes and others like it in Austria or Germany still hold millions in gold. Now, their speculation has been strengthened when, of course, in 2003, another amateur diver discovered a solid gold cauldron. Are you aware of the Kim C. Cauldron can? I've never even heard of such a thing. I never have either. It's pretty interesting. They said that he found it at the bottom of Lake Kimasee, which is in uh, Bavaria. Now, this cauldron was decorated with Celtic and Indo-Germanic figures and is thought to have been commissioned by a top Nazi official who drew inspiration from such mythology. It's estimated that the cauldron, which only weighs 23 pounds, is worth... Almost $100,000. So 
so what do you think of all this lost Nazi treasure that's apparently all around that area? I mean, that is intriguing, right? It's very. It, it, man, it's one of those things. It aggravates me that there's not more. I, I guess that's the reason. I'm. If I had all the money to go do all these investigations, I would go broke just doing the investigations. Well, that's the problem is it's very expensive to go even searching for this stuff. I mean, obviously, there's been lots of divers in the area, and most of them haven't found anything. But there's still people that are holding out hope. Now, there are cases where Nazi treasure has been found. Now, in 2013, check this out. A collection of 1,500 paintings worth an estimated 850 million pounds. Or, of course, again, using my trustordollartimes.com app, that's worth 1,294,847,500 dollars worth of these paintings. Mm-hmm were found festering in an apartment in Munich. The collection, which included masterpieces by Picasso, Matisse, and Chagall, had been hidden by a man named Cornelius, Yukon Cornelius, (laughs) by a man named Cornelius Gerlitt, and he's an 80-year-old son of an art dealer who was trusted by the Nazis to dispose of the seized artworks. So this guy's father was trusted by the Nazis to get rid of these paintings, but he never did. He hid them. All this time, he's had them hid. 1,500 paintings. What I don't get. That's a pretty smart thing to do. It's very smart, but so, I mean. But think of the the chance he was taking. No, oh yeah, right. If they would have caught him, it's over. For sure. Here's the thing, though. Why did, after the war, why did he not return them? Why did he not try to sell them for profit or just, like I said, just return them to the people? He's just been hoarding them this whole time. And you know why? He was passed on to his son, and now he's been hoarding. He's 80. His son's 80. But you know why the, the original guy didn't? No. Because all the Nazis were still out there. Yeah, maybe. If they would have come out, maybe they would have come after him. No, I'm saying when the war ended. That's what I'm saying. They were all still out there. They were just maybe in Argentina, <laughs> things like that. They're all still there. It's just, you know, it's it's not like it just dissolved and all the boogeymen went away. That's true. They just yeah. changed their names and moved to other places. Maybe there is a reason he hung on to Maybe that was his game plan was, you know what, I'm going to hang on to these for a while, and then maybe I can sell them, you know, one at a time. Because I want to know this. Did he sell a few here and there, you know, on the down low and make a little money here and there? Because that's what make it always makes me wonder like that. Well, you're 100% right. And I was thinking of the same thing when we were talking earlier about the, the giant one, the, the giant cachet mm-hmm. that they found in uh, the... The potassium mine? Yeah, in the, the one in the potassium mine. They always say that not all of it was accounted for and that there was still a missing amount, okay? Mm -hmm. My question is, is it really missing? Or was it guys kind of, you know, you see these movies where crooked cops and stuff make a drug bust and they find $100,000 in a suitcase. They turn in 50. Yeah, they turn in 80. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What if a a bunch of soldiers had, look, we're here. It's me and you. It's a small platoon. There's like me and 10 other guys. We called in. We said that we found this. The rest of the guys, the rest of the brass. None of it's cataloged. The generals are going to be here in an hour. Mm-hmm. We got an hour. Why don't we just clip some of this stuff? Because it's not like today. I mean, back then, guys were taking guns, Nazi memorabilia. They were shipping it back to the United States. I mean, I remember you see my grandfather's collection. Yep. A lot of them were doing it. You're telling me you couldn't find, like, say, a cross the size of your the boom of your mic boom right there made of solid gold, and you're like, I'm shipping this thing. Yeah, but I'll tell you this straight up. Of being 100% honest, if I was in that position, it would happen. I'm sure I would do it. Right? Because you got to think about this. You're not talking about coming from where we come from now. You got to think about a lot of the guys over there were probably not very well off. You know, I mean, you're not talking about a booming time. You know, you're talking about people going there not making a lot of money. They go into the military, you know, drafted into the military. Yeah. Or, well, back then, most of them signed up. Or even just like that. They sign up for the military. They go in. They're not making a ton of money. Right here in front of them, they're like, you know what? I could send one thing back, sell it, and buy a house. Right? I You're could talking be, about I could be set. Not just gold. Like, gold would be hard to, es- to yeah. escape with. It'd be heavy. But what if you found a diamond like the size of a baseball? Yeah. Or, or just rubies. Even. Or any size kind of a gems. golf ball. Yeah. You couldn't just slip that in your pocket and just never say nothing to be anybody? Be like, when I send this back, I can buy a, a home. When I'm done at the in the war, I send. I can buy a home. It's all over with. All this work I'm going through, I'll be able to set my life up perfect 
and taking this one jewel, how many people can really say they wouldn't do that? Also, too, you just shot and killed the guys that, you know, you just attacked the guys that had this train or whatever they've got, this cachet, the defendant you've attacked, you've killed everybody. There ain't but like 10 of y'all standing around that even know what's in this these boxes, and everybody's like, y'all going to do it? And like, yeah, let's all do it. Everybody put one in their pocket. Just between us 10. Yep, We're going to take it before the brass and everybody gets yeah. here, and we'll never say nothing to nobody. Fill your pockets and nobody say a word. That's exactly right. That That's could it. easily happen, right? And or I'm not saying you even that... got to involve the 10. If it's just one of you, just slipped it and put it in your pocket and nobody saw it, how are they going to know? It's not cataloged like today. There's no barcode on it. Well, and exactly. And what I'm saying is, of course, that doesn't account for all the amount that was missing, but maybe that happened every time, every stop along the way. So, like, they they clip a little, then they package this stuff up and they ship it. Other guys go through The guys, when like, they get to the boat docks, are like, hey, they pull a little bit out. And then it, every, as it's moving along through the chain of command, everybody's... Not chain of command, but chain of transportation yeah, to get it yes. back to wherever it was going. Paris, I think. Is and I think work. that happened more often than not, probably. And it probably happened across the broad spectrum. The German soldiers probably did it, too. Oh, they did. They said when they when they looted Europe, a lot of the guys, the high SS officials and stuff, if they came across and they were killing all the Jews when they came across like a really rare painting and they really liked it. They said, hey, nope, that one's going to my private collection. Yeah. And they would just, they're all, they're, each of their own private collections were filled with the really, what they were into. But like you're talking about, if you were a soldier, yeah. I imagine just, of course, you know, but, but I mean, every, and I'm not, I, I, it probably didn't happen with every soldier. I'm sure it didn't happen, but there are a few that as it come through would get a, a handful here, a handful there. You know, it's just like when you sit down and eat dinner and your wife reaches over and grabs a French fry off your plate. Exactly. You know, who's going to know? Yeah. She didn't have French fries. I just wanted one French fry. I mean, my wife does. I'm like, what are you doing? I know it's one French fry, but that's my French fry. What are you doing? You know, I just want to try that. Let me have one of your chicken nuggets. Or let me have, you know, it's always a little bit of this. That's how it starts. I think so. A little at a time. That's and, and like you said, it doesn't account for everything, but it does account for some. There has to be some that was gone that way. Well, and I do think that there's still some out there. And so do a lot of the officials. There's a lot of people in that area that say, yeah, there are there is still large caches of missing Nazi treasure. Buried I'm sure. somewhere. Buried we just so- don't know where. There has to be. They're underground. They can, yeah. you know, they, they put them in these caves and then they blew the entrances shut with, you know. Or they got bombed shut and didn't even run it. They don't tell them what you're going to find. Or like how, how how many chances of two farmers or two kids exploring found a cave and they went in there. Well, I'm not going to report this. Don't say if nothing. If I report it, they'll take it. Yeah. Are you aware of the missing Nazi train that was in the news? I That's do a, remember that. You and I discussed some of that at one time. At length, we were talking about some wild. This is because this has been stuff you and I have kicked around in the past about this subject. Mm-hmm. Not so much this hidden hordes that you've found, but this Nazi train thing. Right. Now, that, that missing train is supposedly filled with gold, and it went missing over 70 years ago. And they actually know that the train existed at least 70 years ago. Okay. So there is an unaccounted for missing train filled with gold. So that part's legit. That right. part of the story is real. Right. Now, this all surfaced in around August of this year. And according to a CNN news article from August 20th, two men who are treasure hunters say that they think that they've found it. Now, apparently for a long time, people were aware that this train was missing. So people have been looking for it for a long time. But the area is so vast and, and no one knows really where it went. So there's no real good spot to anchor down where it could be. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It could be in Poland. It could be in Austria. It could be in Germany, any of the surrounding countries. They said that the train went missing, the original train went missing back in 1945 at the end of World War II when the Soviet Red Army was closing in on the forces in Nazi Germany. As local lore has it, the train left Wroclaw, then a part of Germany, and known as Breslau, for Walsbrück, but it never reached its destination. Now two people, a German and a Polish man, said that they think that they have found a 490-foot or 150-meter train that they claim contains Nazi treasure that could be worth millions, perhaps even billions of dollars. Through the local law firm, they contacted the district council of the town they were in with news of their find, and they said that they won't reveal the train's location without a guarantee that they will get to keep 10% of the value of the treasure. Now, to me, that seems fine, right? I mean, that's not greedy. They just want to keep 10% of it, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? That's not saying, hey, I want to keep 80. I want to keep 50-50. That's what They're 10%. Saying, if you'll just guarantee that we can keep 10% of the treasure, we'll tell you where it is. They've been on the same website you was on. They know exactly what it's worth now. Now, CNN News states that one of the two men has a background in excavation projects, 
and he actually has equipment necessary that can detect objects beneath the surface of the earth. It is thought that this ghost train could be in one of the many railway tunnels built in the area around that town near the border of the Czech Republic during World War II, and they think that it could have been sealed off at the end of the conflict. Now, authorities are taking the pair's claim so seriously that the leader of the district council has already met with the heads of the local military, police, and fire service, as well as the prosecutor's office, to discuss their next steps. Now, authorities say that before they can make any guarantees to this, these two men, they need to know where the train is and what's inside it. Oh, I'm sure they do. Yeah, right? Yeah, I'm sure they do. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to show you my cards before you decide to bet. Well, they're I'm claiming, not playing that. They're claiming that if it's a military train, that it might contain other things like deadly weapons, unexploded bombs, or even top-secret Nazi research into nuclear technology. And to add danger, if the train is sealed in an underground tunnel, methane could have built up over the years, creating a risk of explosion if it's disturbed by excavators and stuff like that. So what what they're saying is these men have found it. The men haven't dug into it. So, I mean, they haven't dug down to look at it. They've used whatever kind of device they have, the technology that they are seeing this anomaly in the ground, and they've deduced that it's the train. You know what I'm saying? So yes. they haven't, it's not like it's in a cave and the men have been in it and they know exactly what's yeah. in it. They don't know what's in it. But they need permission to dig it up, to excavate it. And they've gone to the authorities and they're saying, look, we think we've found this missing train. We know the train existed. We know that it left and it never reached its destination. So we know it's buried somewhere. We think we found it. Do we have permission to exhume it? And we only want to keep 10%. And then, of course, the government has come back and said, no, it could have dangerous substances in it. You need to tell us exactly where it is before we guarantee anything. So they're kind of at a stalemate. The guys just want to guarantee that they're going to get something and the government isn't willing to budge. They're like, no, we're not going to guarantee anything until we know what's in it. Local media outlets report that the train could hold up to, get this cam, 300 tons of gold. Ooh. That would be a lot, right? I mean, so they're at a stalemate. So even today, here in November, they're still at a standstill. They're trying to figure out a way. This is a good case for, like, we talk about the giant bones and things mm-hmm. like that. They should have just dug down and just started looking at what they could find, I would think. But I guess you could get arrested and stuff, so. My thing is still this. Look, I understand their concern. There could be weapons. There could be this. There could be that. Yeah, there could be. And then there could be nothing. There could be, yeah, it could be boxes metal. of clothes. Yeah. There could be nothing in there. They're not saying, let us open it without you being there. We're just saying, you're going to guarantee us 10% of whatever's in that train. Yeah. Whatever it's worth, we want 10% of that. Then agree to that and then go on site and be there when the guys unearth it and you have the government there with you and this whole thing shakes down that way. That's fine. They don't have to open it by themselves. You can have people there to make and sure I don't think 10, it's safe. And I don't think 10% is unreasonable. It doesn't seem Well, they didn't have to anything me. before. You're talking about, this is what I'm saying. If you're the government, you didn't have shit sure, before. Now, you get now you're going to get 90% of what they're going to find. Yeah. That's it. The gov- these people only want the whole thing. They want the guys to go, well, tell us where it's at. We'll open it up. And then when we see what we find, we'll go, okay, well, there's there was your 10% is 10% of garbage bags is what we found. Right. Well, remember yeah, earlier in, bullshit. in Lake Toplitz, the Austrian government said they made it illegal for you to dive in that lake looking for treasure. And then they turn around and started diving exactly. into exploration. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Now, there's other types of loot that are still missing, like the ginormous... That's right, ginormous Nazi treasure. The great big humongous. Right. Hitler's personal stash of diamonds is still missing. And they Hmm. said one theory to the key to finding Hitler's personal stash of diamonds may lie in a secret musical code. Now check this out. The theory was suggested by a Dutch writer, Karl Hammer Kati, after he came across a copy of the March Impromptu, which had been scribbled by Adolf Hitler's aide, Martin Bormann. Now, he believes that the notes contain a secret code that leads to where a huge Nazi fortune was buried, including Hitler's diamonds. Now, this hoard was hidden to fund a terrorist group called, get this, Cam, Werewolf, who would continue to take the fight to the Allies even after the Nazis lost the Second World War. That's a cool name, right? That is a cool name. Another man, a Dutch musician named Leon Giesen, 
believes that he has deciphered the clues and followed them to Mittelwald in southern Germany, where he has begun digging exploratory holes. Now another lake. Reports have surfaced that another Nazi fortune may lie beneath the bed of Lake Stolpsee, a 988-acre stretch of water north of Berlin. Nazi leader Hermann Göring reportedly ordered the gold to be dumped into the lake as the Red Army made its final push in 1945. There's even been an eyewitness who reported seeing 30 concentration camp prisoners unloading heavy crates from lorries before ferrying them out into the middle of the lake and then throwing them overboard. The men then rode back to the shore where they were lined up and shot. In 1981, combat divers from East Germany's secret police failed to find any sunken treasure when they searched the lake, but many still think that it exists as well as numerous others in other nearby lakes. So very interesting. Yes. All this missing Nazi treasure. It it makes me think of the Indiana Jones movies, all these things, that there's still treasures out there that are hidden. There could be these mines. They could be wrong on, on the estimates, both high or low. There could be more missing looking right. that they're unaware right. of. Because if you never found it, how could you even calculate how much is there? Well, I would also, I mean, I, I wish that there was a way that they could say, look, it, it, we're willing to work with any of these treasure hunters that find it. We don't have the manpower, the money, the time to put in to looking for these treasures. But if you do, if you find them, we're willing to give you 10% of any treasure you find. The government is. Yeah, like I said, 10% to me is reasonable. But the thing is, the only way to get it would be you have to locate it all, the whole thing, and then you need to come tell us. But also, too, I understand if they kind of opened up the okay to that, people could go and find it, take out what they wanted, then report that they found it and got another 10%, and then now they've got, you know what I mean? Well, and I understand that. And also, it opens up all kinds of doors. Is like if you were to find something and then the people would claim, well, hey, that was my Jewish grandmother's stuff. Exactly. So now you, it's not the state's. You, you should owe me a reparation check right. or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's Because that's the kind of stuff that you open yourself up to once you start finding it. Yes. You're like, wait a minute. We know, you know, somebody tra- traces the, the railroad, railroad files, whatever, and finds that that train car there left this town here. And be like, look, that, my, my great-grandparents lived in that town, so I know that's my family's loot, or at least part of it is. My great-grandmother told me that she had this large emerald collection, and so the emeralds were found there. You guys owe me. $10 million, you know, in a check because you know, you know how that happens. Yes. Or the artwork and things. I think it's amazing, though, that that guy had 1,500 paintings. And just, never did anything with in that them. apartment. Now, I couldn't find where it said what they what they did with the paintings afterwards. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they're like in a museum now or? I would, yeah, I would make the or, assumption. Or, and how does that go, too? Is, it, is there like a statute of limitations? Like, look, it's been in possession of this guy for 70 years. I mean, at what point does it become his property? And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Banger! Lost treasure, lost gold. I'm a sucker every time for any kind of stories of lost treasure. I like the ideas. I can't help it. Especially when it's like missing Nazi gold, <sighs> miss, missing treasure from the from the the you know the Third Reich or whatever. Whatever reason that is. Because you're an Indiana Jones buff. It's just, just like that nostalgia, that romanticism of that, the, that time period. And it just the mystery. It just seems cool. And I'm that way with, with even like the movies. Like uh, what was the one on Netflix? Uncharted. Have you seen the Uncharted film with Marky Mark and the the young fella that plays Spider Man? Does that sound old enough for y'all? Listening? I don't think I've seen. Come this. on, the young guy, the, the new Spider Man. If I you haven't seen it, I think it's based on a on a. Uh, people are going crazy right now on a video game. <laughs> no, I have not seen. Yeah, it. it's pretty good, but it's one of those ones where they're searching for treasure. Oh. Right? Like I like that idea. Yeah, I do too. It's like just what Disney's Jungle Cruise. I dig those kind of adventure looking for stuff like that. You know, and when the Nazis were stealing everybody's treasures, personal items and and putting them in their own large private collections, it makes me wonder like when they max exodus to South America, the Nazis, how much of the of the family jewels and stuff were smuggled over oh, or yeah. now residing somewhere in yeah. South America. You know that, that the idea of that is is it's just wild. neat. When I think of treasure, I think of Indiana Jones. The Lost City of Z, mm-hmm. all that stuff. To me, I just love those stories. It's interesting. The, the fact of it probably got started when I was a little kid when I watched The Goonies 
Maybe yeah. they're looking for yeah. the treasure. I don't know why that is, but that idea of looking for lost treasure just is cool. So part of me still feels like that adventure is still in this world. It's just in the Amazon. Yeah, well. I think that there's still stuff like that in the Amazon. It's just how are we going to get in there to it yet? If there was a place, right? That's where it would be. I mean, especially because like, you know. Or under the sands in the Sahara. I mean, either way, it's going to be one of those two places. Machu Picchu and stuff like that. That that wasn't even discovered until like 1911. Well, wasn't discovered by people willing to report on it. Oh, right. right. The natives. And it's. Yes. That's like, yeah. You're correct. One of those deals. The natives knew it was there the whole time. Oh, yeah. Kind of like. Columbus discovering something, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure he did. Yeah, right. When they were mining gold, copper, uh, you <laughs> right? know, five thousand years before Columbus. Yeah, I've got he a- found it. No one else knew it. <laughs> no one else knew about it. Yeah. Just him. I've got you a Christmas story right here, Brad, that Lon shared. And I, 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 this is great. This dog says, I have a weird story I'd like to present for your consideration. There is no explanation as to what occurred, though I personally believe the supernatural was at play. Now, this was Christmas season in 1958. Okay. So to put you in the mindset of it, have you seen the movie The Christmas Story? Yeah. Right? That took place in 1940. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get an idea of Christmas as you're building up to this, right? My parents and I lived in a small home in eastern Tennessee. We survived on what little money my mother could make doing odd jobs for other people in the area. My father was wounded during the Korean War, and he had received a monthly pension from the government. I was eight years old at the time. After school, I would work around the house and help care for my father. I knew that money was tight and figured there wouldn't be any gift giving this year. But we made the best with what we had. A few days before Christmas Day, I was lying in bed and started hearing noises coming from outside of my window. It sounded like children playing and laughing. So I got out of bed and looked outside. I noticed several blue lights bobbing about in my mother's garden. I went and woke my mother. She got up and we walked out onto the porch. We both clearly witnessed the blue lights moving up and down above the garden. It was very cold, so we went back into the house and watched from my bedroom window. The lights were there for over an hour and continued moving about. We were very tired, so we both went back to sleep. Now, in the morning, we sat at the table eating breakfast. My parents were discussing the blue lights. My father said that he had heard of a similar occurrence when he was a boy. The deacon at his church commented to several of his congregation that he noticed blue lights outside the rectory one evening. His explanation was that these were angels watching over the church. In the next few nights, I watched for these lights, but they never returned. Now, on Christmas Eve, a few family friends stopped by the house during the day to wish us happy holidays, and my friend Larry came over also. We listened to the radio for most of the afternoon. Neither one of us had ever had a television in our home. I mentioned that it would be nice to have one, but I knew that we could never afford it. See, I told Larry about the blue lights and the story that my father had told me. Larry said that his Uncle Joe told him the same story about the blue lights outside the church rectory. So I figured that it must have happened. Larry also said that his Uncle Joe mentioned that they were little people with big heads and large eyes that lived in the mountains. So I asked Larry if his Uncle Joe had ever seen these little people, and he said, well, I don't think so. So that evening, my parents and I were sitting in the front room when we heard what sounded like footsteps on the porch. So my father went to investigate, but he didn't see anything unusual. I then told him what Larry's Uncle Joe had told him. My father just smiled and said that old Joe told a lot of good stories, though most were just not true. My father then said that he remembered a story that old Joe told him one day. My father said that old Joe told him that the little people of the mountain would bring gifts to folks they liked. He said that old Joe thought that the little people were really aliens because he had seen lights fly off the mountain at night. So I prodded my father to tell me more. But he said old Joe told too many stories that were just flat out lies. It was around 10 p.m. so I went off to bed since we were going to go to church on Christmas morning. Now, I woke in the middle of the night to get a drink of water. I didn't notice the time, but I believe it was around 1 a.m. or so. I walked out of my room and into the hallway. I noticed that the same giggling and laughter I had heard the night I witnessed the blue lights. The sound was coming from the front room. I slowly walked down the hallway and peered around the corner. There was nothing there, but I did see a square shape on the floor by the bookshelf. 
So I turned on the room light, and it was a brand new television set, a Motorola. I remember letting out a scream and hearing my mother run down the hallway. She saw me standing in front of the bookshelf, not knowing what was going on. Then she noticed the television, and I can still remember the strange look on her face. Face. I don't know why I've got this going on. (laughs) On her face. (laughs) She turned and ran back into her bedroom, yelling all the way. I could hear her asking about the television while my father answered, what television? We sat in the front room just staring at the television, occasionally looking at each other. Well, that sounds like you're just watching it. (laughs) We never figured out how it got there. I'd like to think it was the little people in the mountain. In fact, that's what old Joe told everybody who'd listen. I do, too. I think. So, I mean, how would you explain it besides family that come by? But who's going to slip into somebody's house? That early in the morning or in the middle of the night to put like, I'm not breaking into your house to leave you a surprise gift. (laughs) Why not? Because I don't want to get shot in my chest. (laughs) Right? That's Uh, the last thing I need to take a shotgun round. I'm tired of aliens always being put in a negative light. Maybe they're good sometimes. They did a little Christmas cheer. They could read your thoughts because they've been abducting you. And they realized that you you really wanted a television. So they're like, yeah, we're going to go get one. That would be the best. (laughs) Like if, if you needed somebody to truly figure out what you needed for Christmas, just get abducted by an alien. Yeah, right? It depends on the type of alien, too. Like, remember the Nordiques are supposed to be like our friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, like, the reptilians or the insectoids. The or insectoids. The, the greys, especially, are supposed to be not your friends. So you got to leave, like, raid and bug traps out to keep the insectoids away. <laughs> and you got to let old guy bring you some stuff, too. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, let old guy bring what you would, some gifts. If, hmm, what would you like to have, like, the little people leave? It can't be food or drink because I already thought about that, and then no. you don't ever get to come back from it. Uh, let's see. Something that they would make. You know what I'd like to have? A little pipe. I'd like to have a little hand carved like those long Gandalf pipes. That'd be handy. Right? Just to be carved out by, like, the little people. Like of course, that. it would take three of them to carry it in. I'd like a little tiny, like, birdhouse. Oh, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm like, down. I'd like to see them watch. I'd like to watch them build it. Well, for them, it would just be a house. Yeah. But for me, it'd be birdhouse. That's it'd be true. Cool. Their, Facts. their Facts. carpentry is masterful. You it know, is. Like they're just like those Japanese woodworkers that, you know, they don't use any. You got nails. the planes and everything's used by joinery. Yeah, I, I can get lost watching videos like that for hours. Yeah. I love that type of thing. I would like to see a little person in a steampunk plane, like we've talked about that one that was sighted in that little flying device. Mm-hmm. That's what I would like to have dropped by just a remote control steampunk plane that the little people can fly in. Who wouldn't like that? Right. When I was Christmas shopping uh, for the boys, yeah. I did see uh, a pretty cool drone that I almost wanted to purchase, but then I talked myself out of it. But I well, like, you know Man. we can talk about whatever <laughs> we want to that, as far as gifts. Our families don't listen. No, they don't. You can say whatever you want to. You could tell everything you bought your entire family. None of them would know. None of them will know. They, they my, won't know. They are totally disinterested. In fact, my kids, will, my older boys, will show me videos. You watch this guy, and I'm like, you know, that's like exactly what we do. Yeah, we covered that seven years ago. They don't listen to one yeah. thing I tell them. So I Because you're know. dad. That's right. I'm dad. You're just dad. Are you ready for Christmas? Like, are, yeah. we, are you in the Christmas spirit, or are you just wanting it to hurry and be over with? To be honest, I don't think I have the Christmas spirit anymore. I don't. Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing in my family says. See? Because I hate joy. That's why they call you grumps. <laughs> That's yeah, right. You hate joy. What is it about joy? I that don't you, know. You have I a disdain know. for people being happy. I just don't like it. I don't <laughs> He's know He's irritated what it is. by happiness, yeah, folks. I am. <laughs> I don't know why. No, it's just I don't, uh, happiness is an inconvenience. That's just the way it feels. You, sir. <laughs> no. You got I'm, any um, uh, New Year's resolutions you're going to try? Yeah, I'm going to. I'm close. Look, I, I'm, I've got to lose some weight. I've got down, I am a few pounds over 200, and I'm trying to get under 200. Oh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you so I've that only, I think I got, because I dipped and I put a little on, I think I'm 14 over now or 11 over right now. So that's my goal is just, some, look, something that's I can actually well, this, see, attain. That, yeah, I was going to say, don't, that's the problem that too many people have is they, they put unrealistic guidelines on something they're trying to do. You know, you got to start start in small increments, and then it builds up over time. I'm trying to work it down to 12 where I can legitly lose a pound a month, and then in December, I'm at my goal, but... You need, like, a stationary bike or something. I got one. Oh, so you my wife like, came home like with watch one. watch TV yeah, while you're doing it. Yeah, she got one. 
That's a good idea. Yeah, so I may I may just start riding the bike. We I, I, I don't know, right? Like I have no idea. I mean, I, I know what it is. I you know like the you know, like the desks that are standing desks. Yeah. I used to work with a guy, and he had a standing desk, and under his standing desk, he had a treadmill, and he would literally walk all day oh, long while he was working. Wild. Well, he was, but this guy was like, a, he ran marathons and stuff like that. But he'd walk those, 10, 15 miles. If y'all are listening right now and y'all are into running and marathons, <clears throat> Tony, uh, y'all need to get y'all a new hobby. <laughs> I mean, like straight up. I, I can't. I, I don't like running. I don't mind running while I'm doing something. Like if you're playing soccer or something, you're running, but you're not thinking about running. But just to just run only, I can't do it. My cousin, I think there's only two things good for running, either to the fight or from the fight. I have a cousin That's it. that like he's obsessed with running. He coaches. Yeah, because he's good at it. That's what I always say. He's like, Dude, yeah, he's you like it because you're good at it. Yeah. Uh, have you seen me? Me and Kyle are not built to run. We're built to carry heavy loads. That's what we were for. We're built more like those dudes in Nepal. <laughs> like the I Sherpas? Just, we just carry, pack it. No, no, I don't have their lung power. I'm a Texas Sherpa, right? Like, well, I've heard, though, if you move white to tail a, fit. Uh, the mountainous areas like that, like it might take, I think they said, I don't remember if it's three or six years, but if you live in a high altitude for like six years, your body will... I believe that. Your lungs will get bigger and things like that. I believe that 100%. Hey, do you have a Christmas movie we talk about every year? Go-to Christmas movie. You, I know you like Die Hard. We always talk about that. Uh, some, just some fun Christmas films because I'm a fan of Violent Night. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With David Harbour? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I liked that one. I liked the whole idea behind it. I, I just, I'm a fan of that kind of crazy Christmas stuff. Yeah, I would say Die Hard is usually one we always watch. Pretty good What's one. another one? Home Alone. I love Home Alone. The first one's just an amazing movie. I never thought about it until I was an adult, but what did Kevin's dad do for a living? Goodness. He had a lot of dough. Man, run hedge funds? I don't know like what this guy was up to, but I don't believe it well, that's was like, legit. That's like Clark Griswold. Did you see the size of their house? It's oh, like, yeah. you know, that's like a $3 million home. That's what I'm saying. It's looking like Kevin's family in Home Alone, that giant thing. And he's all, and Clark's always worried about getting his business, his end of the year bonus or whatever. And I'm like, bro, you. the Jelly you, of the Month Club. That's the gift that keeps on giving, Clark. Yeah, right. Well, I hope everybody out there is ready for Christmas. I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas. Thank you so much for following yes. Cam and I in this show. Uh, we're about to start our 11th year doing it. And it's, uh, we got a lot of things planned for the future. Uh, but I'm so glad that you're all here. And I'm so glad that you follow us. I never thought that we'd be still doing this all this time. Uh, 10 years later, you know, it's it's pretty incredible. It is pretty crazy. And a lot of y'all, too, look, we get we get a lot of messages about how we help y'all. Like y'all, you know, we get messages all the time, of like how bummed out people were, you know, how depressed they were. I want y'all to know you're not the only ones. Kyle and I go through it, too. That's like right. Like you want yeah. to talk about mental health. Our mental health has been put under a lot of pressure the last six months. Kyle and I have taken a beating. And so... You're not alone in this. We're, none of us are alone. So when you think you are, you're not. That's right. We are all in this together. So as long as we all keep just showing up and rowing in the same direction, we're going to make it. That's right. And if you want to give me and Cam a Christmas present, the best thing you could do is be go on any of the platforms you listen to us on. Yes, write us a good like review. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe <laughs> on YouTube. The normal things. And if you really like the show and you want to help us out at the same time while getting stuff back, don't forget there's Expanded Perspectives Elite. There's a whole library of nine and a half years worth of elite shows over there. It's only $5 a month. Uh, it's a, it helps us out tremendously, and you'll get a little more content for yourself. Uh, before we get out of here, let's thank our wonderful sponsors, yeah. Lumi Labs and Microdose Gummies. Microdose mm. is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, just do a quick search online or go to microdose.com and use the promo code EXPANDED to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. And HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash expanded free and use the code expanded free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash expanded free with the code expanded free. And last but not least, AG1. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. You just got to go to drinkag1.com slash expanded. That's drinkag1.com 
slash expanded. Hey-o. And if you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam and the listeners, do not hesitate. You can email the show expanded perspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 888-393-2783. Hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas. Please be careful. Be safe. Spend times with your loved ones and family. And, and we'll see you next week. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all. Thank you.